Thank you very much. Uh, Jordan, would you mind introducing yourself for everyone else? Yeah, sounds good. Let's see. I turn my webcam on here. Um, so I'm Jordan. I'm a red team consultant here at Synergistic. Uh, starting out my career, I worked at Mayo Clinic, uh, believe it or not, as a COBOL programmer. Uh, from there, I moved to the identity and access management team. Uh, and then I worked at Backbone Consultants, where I consulted on uh, quite a few different projects for uh, one of the largest uh, medical device manufacturers. And uh, I've worked on the blue team defending networks, uh, and now I'm on the red team attacking them. So over to you, Morgan. Thank you. Uh, and my name is Morgan Habecker. I'm the manager for the red team here at Synergistic. Uh, I've been in pen testing for about 12 years or so. I, I kind of got into it when I was in the army. I uh, took a class. Uh, the guy said that ethical hacking was a thing, and I just kind of, I, I never really looked back after that. So uh, it's been a fun ride, and uh, I just decided to get into management because, you know, I, I really enjoy working with teams. I really enjoy building with uh, with teams, and um Love what I do. So, okay, we're going to get into this. Uh, before we get together too much, uh, I want to launch the first poll question, uh, which is, do you have an effective security awareness training program? And now, uh, if by effective, I mean, have you had uh, um, some examples in the past where you, you were less effective and you did something, you, you started a new program, and you saw a, a significant improvement or at least a, a noticeable improvement? All right, and then question number two, do you have or have you ever had a password analysis done in your Active Directory environment or really any, any environment that you operate in? Uh, this is really, really important uh, as, as kind of a building block for security, right? Um, this, is, this is something that we're gonna be touching on quite a bit here soon. All right, and while everybody answers those questions, we'll get into some statistics, uh, we, we saw in 2020, uh, actually a lot of information between 19, or 2019 and 2020. Uh, in 2020, there were 3,950 breaches, so almost 4,000 breaches in, in 2020 alone. 17% uh, of those included malware. Uh, and that, that's ransomware, that's a lot of, uh, you know, that could be Trojan horses, that could be really anything that, that w is malicious in, in software. Uh, and that was really, really important, especially for the healthcare industry, because we saw so many ransomware attacks, uh, especially for COVID related issues, right? So uh, people were getting fished a lot. There was a lot of, of social engineering happening that was, it was really kind of unprecedented for how much was, was going on with all this. Uh, and we had 8% of the breaches in 2020 involve authorized users or, or you know, malicious insiders, if you will, they're not super malicious, and usually that included something like misdelivery, where they deliver the right information to the wrong people. And now those people now have you know, access to potentially sensitive information. So uh, this kind of covers quite a bit, right? And if we talk about 2019, right, uh, we had, I think it was like 30% fewer attacks, uh, 30 percent fewer uh, breaches in 2019 than we had in 2020. So there, there was a, a whole lot going on in 2020 just because of the whole COVID thing. We were losing a lot of our uh, uh, staff. Uh, everybody was, was working from home. So there was a lot of, of weirdness going on with trying to figure out remote work for people who'd never done that before. Um, but just in, in 2021, in June of this year, where there were 19 breaches, just this year uh, in, in, in June alone. That included scripts. Now scripts is, is a kind of a unique case uh, where a hundred, more than 147,000 users uh, had their information uh, leaked out. Uh, and this cost scripts 75 million in damages. That's not to say uh, reputation, right? Reputation is a big one for uh, something that, that's really hard to put a price on. It's really hard to put a number to. So there, there's been so many breaches throughout, you know, the, the history of our, our uh, internet and all, and all that, where the, the reputation is what kind of 
sealed the deal. Uh, there was a, a bank back in, I think it was like 2007, where they, they got breached through a physical attack and they, have peop- they lost a, just so much business because nobody wanted to bank with them anymore. Uh, some guy walked in with donuts, schmoozed up the security guard and was able to get the hold of the key. And he stole like, there are almost $30 million in jewels and, and other materials. I walked right out the front door during business hours. It was, it was pretty incredible. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of investors who won't go, no, go near that bank anymore. So, uh, we, you know, you'll, you'll see a lot of numbers in here. You'll see a lot of numbers where they're saying, oh, the average cost of a breach is only 3.86 million. And that might seem like not as much, uh, when you're looking at, you know, total averages, of course, that's still a lot of money for pretty much all of us. Um, but it's not, it's not such a, a, a hardcore number, right? It's not that as, as shocking as, as some of us might, might want to expect. Uh, but we have to take into consideration things like reputation and um, a lot of other issues. So going into some, some more specific information, like um, how, how does this break down, right? And in, again, this is all 2020 data. So we're looking at external actors. 70% of the, the attacks that are the breaches that were, ha- that were happening in 2020 were external forces. These are um, people who are attacking from the internet. This is, you know, organized, uh, um, uh, this is, you know, st- state actors, state threats. These are uh, attacking groups, advanced persistent threats, things like that, that are coming after these organizations. Uh, then they had organized criminal groups. Uh, these are going to be another, uh, these are the, the, the larger uh, threats, the, the MITRE groups, right? Uh, 30% involved uh, internal actors. These are people who are going, who, who are you know, misdelivering or they're you know, maybe disgruntled employees or something like that, something along those lines where they're just, they're, they work for you and they're a threat. And that's not something that's pleasant to think about, but it does happen. Um, so one of the th- stats that I really wanted to, to bring up is the, the stolen credentials. So 37% of breaches in 2020 included stolen or compromised credentials. That means your, your passwords were leaked in some third party breach uh, that, was, that was dumped in the dark web somewhere and somebody got hold of it and said, hey, what can I do with this? They found your, your uh, employee uh, email addresses, they found the passwords and said, hey, let's, let's work on this. Uh, so now they have access to something. Uh, and in most cases, this is the, the passwords are so simple because people are just iterating them by one. So yeah, it might be an older password, but if I just iterate those by you know, one number or two numbers or whatever the case might be, then I can eventually potentially find the right password. So those are really important. And we most organizations still haven't implemented, at least not effectively, two-factor authentication or multi-factor. So we're still running off the old username and password thing from you know, ye olde times. So 22% of those also included phishing or some form of, of social engineering. Uh, and that was really, really important, especially in 2020, because 22% is quite a big number. Uh, that, that's a lot of what we end up seeing, a lot of things that we end up trying to do, is, but even with pen testing, right? We love the social engineering. We really enjoy that stuff. I can talk for days about stories on, on good times that I had trying to fish people or bypass doors or do some sort of social engineering. And the phishing itself is probably the easiest thing we can do as pen testers because it almost always works. Uh, we get in there, the, the awareness training that we're doing is usually pretty lame, if we're honest, right? It's people who are required and, and you know, mandated to take this little thing online and they get in there and they, they turn on their music or they turn on Netflix and they're just sitting there right next to it, clicking next. They're, they're not really paying attention to what's in that. So when I talk about effective awareness training, that's kind of what I'm, what I'm trying to get to is how effective is it? Are they paying attention? Are there real life examples for them to take, take it personally? Um, things like that are really, really important. And finally, I want to talk about those internal actors. So the internal actors are something that we have to always be aware of. It's, it's something that's been around since the dawn of the internet and probably threat actors since the dawn of time were, were internal. Uh, you know, we, we've always heard, uh, even in back in, uh, was it like Caesar, right? Like internal, internal threats are, are, are real. 
Uh, so even now, nothing has changed. We still have people who get disgruntled, who are just angry at the world, uh, or just angry at you as, as, your, as their boss. And they want to maybe take a little bit of action here and there. And it may be so small, and they just don't realize how, how much of an impact it might have. Or it could just be a pure mistake. Maybe they, they've been up for 24 hours, and they accidentally sent the, wrong, uh, or the right information to the wrong person. So th this is this is kind of a big one that is really hard to put a pin in, but through uh, you know appropriate security measures, monitoring, we can mitigate a lot of these uh, these factors. Which brings us to our next poll question: uh, Do you know who your MITRE attack threat groups are? Uh, these are the advanced persistent threats. Um, any uh, if if you've ever been to the MITRE framework site and you look through those groups and you read through them, it's actually fairly entertaining. Uh, and terrifying. There's there's groups like uh, there's one guy called uh, Snack Mackerel, and he they rather rather were responsible for the DNC attacks uh, against the 2016 uh, election in the United States. So there's a lot of stuff like that in there um, where you'll you'll see some famous attacks that they've done and some of the cool stuff that they've that they've achieved. Granted, yes, it's bad, but it's, you know, from our perspective, it's like okay, that guy. They, they, they did some really, really crazy stuff. Yeah, and there's, there's actually one group that um, specifically targeted healthcare, and they're called Deep Panda, and they're suspected to be a Chinese threat group, and uh, they're known for the Anthem data breach. So uh, knowing this, you can go out there and actually review their attack tactics, and then monitor your network uh, so that you can defend against them. Absolutely, um, and these these are really good. So, uh, it's a it's a really good idea to understand who your opponent is, right? You can't get in the ring without understanding your opponent. Boxers do this all the time when they when they get into the ring. They're watching the videos of, of their opponent. And they're trying to understand like what what are they going to do? Are they moving their foot right before they punch? Um, things like that, right? So we're we're talking about understanding who your opponents are. And if you look at the MITRE framework uh, and their their group section. You can understand different APTs and how they're going to attack, what they're going after. Are they just basically using bots to try to get a foothold in and they're not targeting you at all? It's just a opportunistic moment, right? That's really important information to know as you, as you go down this roadmap. Okay, getting into the red teaming and what we're here for, right? Uh, so what is a red team? A red team is... Uh, designed specifically to test your resilience, uh, not just you know you as a person and, and your mental fortitude. Right, we're here to to understand your organization, figure out who is coming after you. So, using the MITRE attack framework to understand the groups that are coming after you, understand their methodologies, then apply those methodologies to you to to, to test your to test or validate your security. We're looking for anything and everything that can be used against you. We're looking to see if yeah, maybe, uh, you, maybe you have a, a security guard who can be seen on Google Maps sleeping on the job. That can tell me quite a bit, right? Um, do you have a lot of people wearing their badges on their hips? That's a lot of really cool information. Uh, do you have uh, you know, a, a web application firewall through a really poor vendor that I know how to get around? There's a lot of really cool stuff in there. Uh, but we're testing specifically to achieve a goal, right? Uh, red teaming is more specifically goal oriented. So we're identifying your critical assets. We're trying to see how can we get access to those assets and figure out where the gaps are. Uh, red teams are really useful for uh, going, going up against a blue team. So if you have people who are monitoring, we can say, hey, this is what we've been doing. Did you pick it up? So why you need a red team is is pretty complicated now. There's in in 1983, January 1st, 1983 is, is technically the, the birth of the internet as we know it. Uh, and, and we have constantly grown, right? Every time a new technology comes out, somebody goes, I need that. And then we put our, our old technology aside and we don't really get rid of it. We don't really fix it. We're like, well, I've got something new now. So we've, we've built up all this, all these assets, right? And, and maybe you still have Windows XP. 
I'm, I, how, how many people in this room, I mean, in this group, have Windows XP on their networks? I'm willing to bet there's at least some of you who still have it, who might need it for a specific reason, that's fine, but you still have it. Um, and in this case, like I, I was doing a, a gig against a casino, it was a physical attack against a casino, it was a whole chain. And it was really interesting because they were using Windows XP, like an unpatched old version of XP as their uh, gaming computers. So like everything that was being controlled by the computer, all the, um, the gaming systems, like their slots, they had the jackpot system was, was a Windows XP box. They had a lot of really, um, like their, their blackjack tables. Uh, I, don't, I don't know what all the games are, but they had a lot of Windows XP boxes around there. And it was, it was a lot of fun to take over them and say, hey, look, why, why are you still using this? Usually the explanation was, we got that a long time ago uh, and we can't upgrade it because the software that we have, it only works on that. And that's what we hear a lot of the time. And my answer would be like, why don't you get new software? I'm sure there's somebody out there who can code that for you. You can, there's tons of places you can go to get new code. That's not going to cause a breach for your organization. So um, malicious actors have gotten better at figuring out all these holes, right? Uh, Windows XP, when they first came out, does anybody remember that they said they were unhackable? And I think it was tw less than 24 hours later, they had their first, uh, um, actual exploit. So these, these guys are, they're smart. They know what they're doing. They know, they understand the code better than most of most of the developers. Uh, they, I'm sorry, you would go, you would get new technology, they can break it. So if you're not keeping up, you're not protecting your technology in the first place, they're going to keep going. Uh, so organizations eventually due to all these attacks and all this, all the stuff that's happening, you know, having all this really bad infrastructure, having all these really old uh, systems, all this really old stuff, they ended up take, taking on a reactive uh, approach or a reactive stance. Um, and this is bad for a lot of reasons because we, we're, not in, we're not trying to anticipate our, our attackers. We're trying to just say, well, they're going to get in at some point. All we can do is try to, uh, to fix the whole one they do. And that's, that's kind of the wrong approach. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Um, so we need to move to protect. Uh, we have to protect more and more. Uh, every time we get new assets, we have to protect them. Every time we get new hires, we have to protect them. Every time we do anything, uh, we, we put a new policy out. How are, how are we protecting that policy? Um, we need to start simulating these threats. The red team itself is there to simulate those threats. It's there for validating these controls it's testing your, your resilience against these threats. So um, you get a red team and they're there to make sure that everything you've been doing, all of the, the compliance, all of the, the uh, pen tests, everything that you've been doing, all the, thing, the, all the work you've been putting into your network, your organization is there to be, um, is, we're just checking to make sure everything's good. That's really all we're doing. Okay, poll question number four. Do you have a security information and event monitoring or SIM tool? Uh, this can be anything from Alien Vault and, and uh, uh, tools that are designed for this, or you know something like Splunk that is kind of put in that position where it's just logging or it's just collecting logs and then you're you know reviewing those logs or having a, a script or a tool to review those logs for you. All right, and the next question would be to uh, what is your what is your current security limitation? Um, I know a lot of organizations that we talk to, normally it's budget, it's, it's expensive, security is expensive. You know, there, there's a reason for that. Um, what about resources? Is it gonna be something like, oh, you don't have the people to support this kind of, uh, of, of these actions? So this is something we, we're very interested to, to understand. We'll, we'll start covering all these questions here in a few minutes. Um, now, why, why are we talking about a roadmap in the first place? I mean, what, what is this roadmap? Uh, and, and the answer to that is the journey, right? Security is not a one time, you, you do a pen test and suddenly you're gold. Suddenly you you've have all the answers, you know all the things, you have one vulnerability report from a scanner from you know, Nessus or Qualys, and suddenly you're good. Like, it's just not how it works. It is a journey. There is a whole lot of things you have to understand um, 
part of that is going to be understanding, you know, gaps in your security and understanding how to fix those things, understanding where uh, custom assessments might come in, where is the best, uh, what is the best approach to fixing your issues. Uh, and if you want to think about it in, in an, uh, an analogy, uh, you know, you're the, you're the driver of this car, right? We're the GPS. We're just trying to help figure out like, what is the next step? What is the thing you need to work on right now? Um, and the roadmap ends with a red team assessment. Now, this whole journey that we're gonna be talking about, this whole map concept is really geared around four basic pillars. So detecting the threat, reacting to it, containing the threat and then defending. And the way I like to think about this is, can you detect the guy on your network? If you can, what can you do about it? If you have a way to react, can you contain the threat? And if you can contain the threat, if you can kick them off your network, can you keep them off your network? So as we go down this little uh, sprint here, think about all of these, because each of these, these pillars are, are in each of the, the next uh, strategies, those, those, those four building blocks, right? So each of those four building blocks should contain each of these items. All right, Jordan. Yeah, sounds good. If you wanna go to the next slide, it's perfect. So jumping into the four building blocks for uh, you know, an effective red team readiness. Um, this really is the foundation of, you know, a great red team, an effective security practice. And with these blocks, they stack on top of each other. So you really need a solid foundation. And that really starts with compliance and gap analysis. So, um, you know, you're checking the box for your regulations. Uh, you're viewing your organization's security as a whole and finding those gaps and filling them. And then uh, moving on to, you know, threat detection. Um, you know, you're implementing a vulnerability scanning tool. Uh, you're implementing a SIM. And then from there, uh, you can sort of test those services uh, with a, a penetration test and other managed services. So we're taking a, a deep dive uh, into your, your network, your web applications, your physical security. And then we can take a broad approach with some of those other managed services to ensure that you're implementing an effective uh, security program. And then finally, the, the last block, fourth one, uh, is red team analysis. So you're validating the effectiveness and implementation of you know, blocks one through three and this is really a real world analysis of how uh, a malicious actor would gain access to your critical assets. So we can start out with the first one. If, Morgan, if you wanna to go to the next slide. Uh, block one is compliance and gap analysis. So uh, what is it? Um, everyone knows you know, compliance. It, within healthcare, you have different regulations. We have HIPAA, SOC 2, CMMC. Um, and, and gap analysis is looking at this uh, every single uh, area of your security as a whole. And, you know, if I could just one example. Um, so let's say your organization is a hospital uh, and you would determine that uh, your hospital beds are a critical asset. Everyone loves your hospital beds and, you know, they tend to get stolen. So you're going to lock them down to the floor. You're going to secure those hospital beds. Uh, but another thing that everyone loves uh, is the, the patient gowns, of course. Uh, and they're in a closet right next to the hospital beds. Uh, and then also on top of that, you've got no lock uh, to get inside that room. Uh, you have some gaps there. So in this situation, uh, you can prioritize that and put a lock on that, that door to get into that room. That temporarily secures the, you know, those hospital gowns and it also secures the hospital beds. And then within time you can, you know, throw a lock on the closet to further secure those gowns. Uh, so, you know, real world, you want to identify those critical assets and they can be different, uh, you know, depending on your industry. So 
you want to start out by identifying, uh, you know, you want to define what critical means to you. You know, let's say it could be, uh, you know, a database with patient records. Uh, it could be a server that contains HR information. And, you know, you can identify these critical assets in a, a number of different ways. You know, let's say it's from a risk assessment or uh, you identify your network traffic patterns uh, to identify those. And then uh, once you've got those identified, you want to add them to uh, an asset inventory and track those as best as you can. And um, to frame that, you know, to frame that, to find those gaps, uh, you can ask yourself, you know, do my security tools have visibility into some of these critical assets? Who accesses them? Uh, you know, full picture, look at your environment. Uh, you know, are you worried about ransomware? What, how is your backup procedure? Things like that. And then uh, once we've analyzed all of these gaps in your security, you can move on to prioritizing. And really in this stage, it's important to um, look at that full list and not just not just throw everything okay we need to fix it all uh, it's really about uh, figuring out what's most important and that you can fix and close that gap uh, you know first that would be you know maximize that benefit to the organization and then moving on to block two uh, we have implement uh, a threat detection and management uh, so with this, um, you know, what does this really mean? So you're performing your vulnerability scans. Uh, you start off by, um, you know, configuring your scans to the appropriate network. You want to uh, make sure that they are authenticated scans. Uh, make sure your scans are, um, you know, taking a look at some of that, the low hanging fruit uh, that's on your network so that once a, a pen tester comes in, they don't have to review some of these uh, lower vulnerabilities over and over. And, you know, from there, you're, you're implementing a, a SIM tool and you're monitoring some of those important assets to your organization. And once you've done this and, you know, you've performed your vulnerability scans, uh, you really want to uh, review it all and just make sure that you are sort of taking those key, um, you know, things that you can close out because I've seen it sort of time and time again where, uh, you know, it sort of gets pitched over the fence to the remediation team and they, they sort of look at you like, like we need to close all of this. And really it's, it's taking that, that step by step, uh, like, we can close out this vulnerability and it sort of takes away uh, some of the other ones that are further down the list as well. Um, and again, this is, these are very important because they stack on top of each other so that this really ties into uh, your compliance because they can detect if you are, you know, remediating some of these vulnerabilities that you found. And then moving on to block three, we have, um, penetration testing, and other security services. So uh, this one to me is, is very important. So this will really ver validate and verify the, the blocks before this, so blocks one and two. And so, you know, starting out with managed services, you have a broad uh, sort of spectrum there. So you have, um, you know, whether you're, you're performing a password analysis. And I, I, I'll, I'd highly recommend it as a pen tester. You know, we go on to engagements and really that's, that's, a key, um, that's a key vulnerability that leads us to domain admin access. Um, and if you'd like, you can feel free to reach out to us for more information. Um, with, you know, the number of data breaches going up and up and up, it's on the rise, leaked passwords, there's weak passwords, uh, it can put your organization at risk. So um, I can't tell you how many times I'll go on to a set an assessment and, you know, I'll find a, a database with, you know, default credentials, SASA. And 
From there, you can gain a shell onto that server, escalate privileges all the way to domain admin access, and then you know, start poking around into uh, sensitive data. Um, there's other services, there's uh, risk assessments. You can identify uh, other threats to your organization um, that could prevent you from your ability to conduct business. Um, if your vendors have access to your data, use a uh, vendor security management service so that uh, you know you don't know if they're going to be just as careful with your data as you are. Uh, v VCSO services. It's always good to get a, a second opinion on uh, your security program implementation. And then, you know, there's there's another. Uh, you can leverage a service that another service that we offer, which is continuous automated penetration testing. Uh, it's a tool that we can run 12 times a year for a relatively low cost. And it shows you some of that low hanging fruit that could be on your network so that you can remediate it before the, you know, a human pen tester comes in and it makes it more challenging for that tester and it allows them to focus and hone in on some of those problem areas in your network. Um, so, you know, what is a penetration test? It's more of, uh, you know, that finely focused, you know, with managed services, it's, it's more of a, a broad approach. And with penetration testing, it's a, a really a deep dive into your network, into your web applications, and it's finding those, those key little misconfigurations or vulnerabilities that can be exploited. Uh, and again, this ties back to, you know, once you get this, uh, you know, your pen testing report and you've, you know, remediated some of those vulnerabilities uh, that ties back into compliance. So they can, you know, review whether you've, you've closed that or not. And then, uh, you know, the, you'll, you'll see things start dropping off your, uh, your vulnerability scans. And then moving on to block four, uh, which really is a cherry on top, is the red team analysis. So this, uh, as a red teamer, you know, we're coming for everything. So every aspect of, uh, you know, whether it's physical or logical, um, you know, trying to break into a building or break into a web application, uh, this really tests all of your defenses. Uh, so you, you know, blocks one through three prepare you for this assessment. And really this is a real world uh, attack. This is exactly what a malicious actor would do. Uh, you know, they can pick locks. Uh, they can attempt to exploit one of your servers and then escalate privileges. Uh, and, and with this, it really tests your security as a whole. And, you know, once you, you've got this uh, report back, uh, you want to remediate some of those issues. And then again, this sort of ties back uh, to the beginning. Uh, you know, you found some of these gaps with your red team analysis, and then it just starts all over. Um, and, you know, with this, it's really an effective way to manage your security and find some of those gaps within your, your network, uh, your, you know, physical layer. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll turn that back over to you, Morgan. Excellent. Um, thank you, Jordan. So one, another thing to note about red teams is they are essentially double blind. Uh, when we when we do a red team assessment, it's for you know maybe twelve to sixteen weeks long, uh, or at least we have a window that's twelve to sixteen weeks. You don't know when we're going to show up. You don't know when we're going to start our assessment. So it's really really important to understand that because we are we're taking the time to do reconnaissance at a much much deeper level than you would get for any kind of pen test. Uh, because we're we're looking for anything and everything we can find. We're we're impersonating people. We're maybe trying to find blueprints if if the facility is is on the menu, uh, and so on. So something something to keep in mind. Uh, these these kinds of assessments are really really in depth, and when you get the results back and, and all the information, it can take a long time to go through and sift everything out and try to figure out like where, 
where all the little gaps are and where all the holes are and then pull, uh, produce a, a, a comprehensive enough report that we go all the way back to the beginning with block one and start that again. And that really kind of gets everything going down this, this kind of journey, right? When we look, we review the goals, we we're assessing everything. We're targeting everything. We're trying to figure out where all the, all the gaps are. Uh, and in this case, you, you need to leverage your, your brain trust where you have people who are ex experts in various uh, uh, industries or, uh, various methodologies say, Hey, what am I, what am I missing? What am I doing wrong? What, what can I do better? How can I fix this hole? And when you're done, you end up with this um, really cool strategy that it, it, it's not complicated. It's not super lengthy. You don't need, you know, a, a doctorate degree to, to figure it all out. You end up getting with, um, you know, consistent, defense of your network, your assets. Uh, you understand who your threat actors are. You understand your own organization better. You en end up being able to grow more confidently because now I can get these assets and know that there's a, a procedure in place to deal with that. Uh, instead of just shunning or forgetting about that old uh, SQL server or that old thing over here, or, you know, yeah, we, we've had this thing for years and it just works. So why fix it? Right. That's, you know, we need to be able to grow more confidently and more securely. Um, you should be able to continue securing your critical assets, uh, whatever they might be. And, and we keep saying critical assets, and I should say all assets, because all assets can be critical. Um, and, and one example of this, I was doing an assessment. It was an internal pen test against an organization that dealt with uh, space satellites. It was actually one of the coolest places I've ever been to, because I'm a big bit of a space nerd, if anybody hasn't noticed that stuff. Um, and we couldn't get in anywhere. Like there was no, they, they had really, really good protections on everything. And then we happened to notice a, a, a host that was unlocked. It was a, a laptop that was being used as a print server, had a little printer attached to it physically through USB. Uh, and we got on there and we, uh, uh got a back door through it but there was really nothing we could do with it. There were no credentials on it. There was nothing we could really do. So we called the help desk and said, hey, uh, I'm having a problem printing something. Could you log into this, this box and help me out? They said, sure. And they logged in with admin credentials and now we had those creds and we were able to compromise the rest of the domain that way. So it was just one little thing, one tiny thing that everybody thought was, was you could just ignore it. It's just a print server. Nobody can really do anything with that. Uh, but it ended up being like the critical hole, the critical issue um, that we were able to use to get in. So with that in mind, you know, all assets are critical. All assets are, are you know, in need of protection. You can't just ignore them because they're part of your everyday life and, and they're just there for your use, right? So printers are a big one. I've, I've, um, I was doing a gig for a healthcare insurance organization and I broke in uh, through badge cloning and other methods. And I went up to the second floor. I made a lot of ruckus. I was tearing this printer apart, you know, taking all that they had all those like stacks and ex extra add-ons on there. I was pulling that stuff off and everybody's just kind of like, Oh, whatever. He must be working on it. They completely ignored me. It was a packed building. Uh, so I get it. I'm wheeling it very noisily down the hallway. I get it into the elevator uh, and I'm going downstairs. I get it through the head of, uh, uh, turnstile to get out and in. So I get it through the turnstile and then I walk out with this massive printer. Uh, and it was, it was a lot of fun because I, I'm like taking a selfie with this saying, nobody stopped me. Nobody tried to do anything. Uh, and what's really interesting about that is that I could have taken the hard drive out. And if anybody's ever uh, seen the inside of those hard drives, uh, seen the contents of those hard drives, those are, those are a big threat because Everybody at your work, chances are good they've they've used that thing for a personal reason of, of some kind. They, they've uh, scanned their driver's license so they could get an account somewhere or do something. Uh, they, they've scanned their um, uh, passport or social security card or bills for a home address or whatever the case might be. All that information is stored in those in those hard drives. And some of the newer ones take some steps to protect that information. They are encrypted. They're only stored for you know a day or two and then they're gone. 
so there's a lot of cool protections that are in place more more recently. But if you've got an older one, I can get a hold of that information. Uh, and there was a, a guy who did a TV show a while back who um, he was buying those kinds of things from eBay and then taking the hard drives out and pulling all the data off. So it was really neat to see uh, that there was still tons of data on them. By the way, those are, are critical assets. Um, anything you have is a critical asset. Obviously, when we're talking critical, critical, we're talking about you know things that you would consider as a business critical. This is databases. This is things that um, you know information that you need to protect. Uh, if you are a, a software development organization, you you don't want your your source code getting out. Right? You don't want anything like that to happen. You don't want somebody to come in and make modifications that could harm your organization. So. Of course, that's critical, but I, I want everybody to broaden that spectrum a little bit to include things that could be potentially innocuous. And that's what these these tests are for. They're trying to say, hey, yeah, uh, you you did this gap analysis, you did all these cool things, but then I came in here as a pen tester and I found this one little print server that you, you were ignoring because it's just a little print server. Um, and that, that's how we're going to get more secure by, by really broadening our focus on every little thing. Okay, uh, finally, creating a remediation plan uh, and adjusting your, your intrusion detection, your intrusion prevention, that's what the red team is really for. So we come in, we do all these things, we record everything, we, sh we show the logs and I say, hey, you show me your logs and I'll show you mine. Uh, you, you, you had a detection, you detected something over here, cool. I can pull up my logs and I say, this is what we did at that time. Did you see anything before that? And we can say, look, uh, we were doing all sorts of stuff before that. Let's tweak your intrusion detection. And then and now we can get more, more detailed, more focused on what was happening. And now uh, you can start hopefully detecting more. So the roadmap itself, um, this is something that, that we do as, as an organization that Synergistic does. Uh, we've sold it to, to a few clients. Uh, it's, it's a long-term strategy. It's a, you know, it usually takes uh, maybe one to anywhere from one to three years to complete, depending on the organization, what your current maturity is. Uh, of course, there's a lot of assessments that go into this kind of thing um, to, to determine how long that would sort of take to begin with. Uh, and this is kind of what we've been talking about this whole time, right? And of course, it doesn't have to be us. You can go to any, any organization that, that performs these sorts of services that has a broad range of services and say, hey, I want you to make me more secure. Help me get from point A to point B. I need, I need that GPS, I need that guide on this road. So uh, with that in mind, um, let's do the final question. Uh, would you consider the roadmap approach for your organization? Uh, we're, we're asking this not just for ourselves, but you know, is this strategy something that you, you find feasible? Is this something that you could adopt in your organization uh, and start uh, continuing down that road, right? Uh, which brings us to the next steps, uh, which are to, for, for any healthcare or a, really any organization period, you need to build that roadmap. Um, you start with, it, normally they would start with vulnerability scanning. They kind of do things backwards from block one and block two. And the, really those are, are relatively interchangeable because you're gonna need the scanning anyway. So if you start with that, it's fine. Uh, start with that, get some managed services. Uh, password analysis is a really, really good one. It's usually really inexpensive. Uh, it makes a huge difference because Jordan will tell you, any pen tester, anybody who's in this industry will tell you 99% of the time uh, it's passwords that get us uh, in the door. Uh, there's, of course, vulnerabilities. There's things we can exploit. There's a lot of things we can really do. Uh, but passwords are, in, in, at least in my opinion, uh, through many years of testing uh, are, are usually the, the biggest threat, the biggest gap in any, uh, any, any organization. And you need to make sure that all your other gaps are filled. You need to make sure that you are patching that wall up. You know, if you're build, if you're using these building blocks, do them over and over again. You know, we're going to do the compliance. We're going to check, check those boxes because that's what compliance really is, is just checking those boxes. Are you doing this? Cool. Go ahead. Uh, and then you do the pen testing to make sure that you did it correctly. Uh, you're validating everything that you've done, all your remediation, all of the reports that you've got, and make sure you're prioritizing everything that you're doing. And that's how we're really going to get a, a good complete uh, program or complete assessment of our security. And then once you've done all that stuff and you feel ready, 
confident, your, your uh, reports are coming back with fewer and fewer issues. Now you're ready for that, that red team. And then you can start really digging into the fine tuning of, of how your organization handles security. Okay, and that's it for me. Uh, we can now go into a uh, Q&A. So anybody who has questions uh, can post them in the Q&A section. Hey, Morgan, thank you. That was a really informative, um, definitely for all of us. Um, can you go through each of the polling questions and share the responses? Absolutely. Love it. Okay, so question number one, do you currently have an effective security awareness training program? 83, almost 84% said yes. That's awesome. That is something we, we really wanted to see. I was very curious about this. Uh, I've had a lot of clients come and ask about um, awareness training. How can we do it better? How can we improve it? Uh, because most of what we see is um, like no before and a bunch of others that are doing this kind of awareness training as a service. And they kind of drive me crazy because they never make it personal for the user. It's, you know, Sally saw an email, what should she do? And I, I've never found that to be very effective, at least in my experience, because we, we go to Sally all the time and she never uh, uh, refuses our emails. Um, and when I was in the military, when I was in pretty much every organization I've ever been in, it's the same training over and over again. You're going to just click next until you reach the end or some question. And it's, it's super easy, you know, multiple, multiple choice. It's never personal. So we, we do a, a, a awareness training program that requires us to do something, right? So social engineering, password analysis, something along those lines where we do, we stack all these kinds of assessments together and then we present the findings, of course, redacted. There's no, real information in there. Uh, but we, we present the findings like how many passwords were using dictionary words, uh, how many people clicked the link, uh, how many people were submitting credentials, things like that. And, and in some cases, uh, that may, or rather in most cases, that makes a big impact. A lot of times we'll show some of the tools that we use to get access, like I'll show fake IDs and a bunch of other cool stuff, like some of my physical pen testing sort of, sort of stuff. And people really enjoy seeing that sort of thing. And it's, it's a fascinating uh, thing to do. All right. So thank you for answering that. So the majority of question number two, do you know, do you now have, or have ever had a password analysis done in your active directory environment? 50, almost 53% said yes. And, or it's in our future. And the other half said, not sure. And that's, that's interesting. Um, and 6% said, tell me more. So password analyses are really fascinating. Um, if, if you can't tell by now, I'm, I'm kind of a password nerd. So I like digging into that stuff. I, I crack passwords for fun. I've got probably 10 to 12, you know, it's about, it's, almost, it's closer to 12 terabytes now of password dumps that I've found from various locations. Uh, so any, anytime I go up on an assessment, I'm looking there, I'm going to put in the domain in that in my own database and look and see if I have any of those credentials. Uh, they almost never work anymore, um, but sometimes you get lucky. So doing these password analyses, one of the things that, that we do is we, we look not just at passwords because yes, those are really interesting to, to understand, but what about the, the people? So you can, when you're working on a password uh, crack, right, you can crack up to however many they have remembered. So uh, in, your, in your domain controller, if you've set it to remember the last seven passwords, so people constantly have to rotate their password and they can't use the one prior, that's what that means. And we can crack all, all those backwards. And normally what you see is they, inter, they iterate them by one number or one letter or one something. So they don't have to memorize a whole new password. That's typically what you see. Um, but what's interesting is that, especially for like admins, the, they'll have a regular user account and then they'll have their admin account. Are those passwords the same? How many of these users are using the same base words? How many of these users are using dictionary words? How many of them are in the sales department? How many of them are in marketing? How many are in HR? Who, you know, which department should you focus your attention on? 
th those are all answers you should be getting with any password analysis. It, it should not just be, we crack 78% of your passwords, have a nice day. It should be, where should I focus my training? Where should I really focus my attention so that I can improve and not just keep talking to the same people and say, hey, did you change your password yet? Because they're just gonna iterate another, uh, another, another number. You need to get their, those, those people trained. All right, number three. Do you know who your MITRE attack threat groups or advanced persistent threats are? This one is, is really cool because as, as pen testers, you know, hackers, whatever you want to call us, this is, this is kind of our area, right? This is where we, we like to see what others are doing. Uh, and in most cases, we learn a lot through what they're doing because I can see this person used a botnet. Cool, I'm not really going to be using a botnet against a client. That's, that's kind of extreme. Um, and in some cases, we might do it. Who knows? Uh, could get lucky. The other thing is, what process are they using? When they get access to something, there is another step. Like I said before, they, they kind of leave a fingerprint. So when Jordan gets access to an internal network, what is his first step? He might run a tool called Responder, which looks for credentials passed through SMB channels and, and uh, NetBIOS and LLMNR, link, lo link local multicast name resolution. It's a big word. So he might do that. Um, he might do another thing. He, there, there's a lot of things he could do. But basically, when he gets on a network, he is going to do something in a specific way. He's got his process laid down. I'm the same way. I have my process kind of lined out. When I, when I get onto a network, I will start Responder. I'll keep that going in the background. I'll run my network mapping tools. I'll go over to here, do this, I'll do this. Same thing when I'm doing a web application. I, there's a certain uh, order of things that I do. Those show up in logs and those logs are now cataloged. And now we can figure out kind of who's doing what. So snack mackerel or, uh, <clears throat> knife beard or whomever these these guys are now we have a blueprint of what their process is what their methodology is so now we can go through and say hey these guys here they typically target uh healthcare organizations because they are ransomware guys and they can get in there and do their thing and get paid they're usually financially motivated right so that's that's why we really need to know who our uh, who our opponent is because if I say, hey, uh, these guys, when they get in, they typically do this. So now you can go, okay, well, they do that. Let's lock that piece down. Kind of gives you a, a, a miniature roadmap in itself on how you can help defend your network. Those are really, really neat. Okay, do you have a security information and event monitoring or SIM tool? Wow, almost 80% said yes, that's incredible. Um, not what I was expecting. Normally we, we don't see a lot of those uh, within healthcare at least. Usually those tools are very expensive. Uh, Alien Vault being a really decent but free-ish one, it's usually fairly inexpensive. Uh, of course, if you pay for the pro, the pro version, there's a lot of perks for that, but it, 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 there is an open source version for that one. So if that's something that you're interested in, you should probably go check that out. Um, but there's a lot of cool stuff that these sims do. Uh, in a lot of the cases, we, we see them, they're either not tuned properly or they just don't exist at all. Um, we, I've been to several clients who, you know, we were doing the, the loudest things we could possibly do and they never saw us, didn't know we were on their network and, and so on. I've been to other clients where the second I do anything, I was immediately locked out. Uh, I, I was at one, it was a, it was a power company. And I plugged in my device, it registered fine, it was able to get onto the internet. I go back to my car and I'm now like in their network and suddenly I don't have a connection anymore. Like they, as soon as my, my MAC address showed up on their network, they instantly quarantined it. And the second I logged into it and sent the first command, it locked it out completely. So. It was a really incredible uh, way that they were doing things, but the only way they were able to do that is through their SIM. So they actively detected my uh, MAC address, they blocked it, and then they kicked me off the network and kept me off. 
So that was like the perfect example of, of how to uh, deal with a red team. Very good. Yeah, and, and Morgan, just so I can jump in, the best mm -hmm. part, you know, one of the advantages of having a sim and tying this back to uh, knowing who your threat groups are. So the Deep Panda, um, you know, threat group, one of their attack tactics is to use uh, net use, uh, net use with a, some kind of compromised credential. So in your SIM tool, you can set that to alert you uh, to whether or not, you know, that is uh, being executed across your environment. Uh, and right away, you can look at that and say, yep, this is malicious. Uh, this is something I need to lock down. Very cool. All right, uh, next question is, what is your current security limitation? And not half and half uh, are bu between budget and resources. 4% um, said we have no uh, limitations because we're, we're awesome and that's fantastic. Um, so the, the budget and resources are, are that's normal. Uh, we see that all the time and that's why you know organizations like ours we try to keep the prices as low as we can. Of course, resources for us are very expensive. Uh, so we, we try not to, to go too far, but um, this is where managed services really take a brunt of the load with uh, something like using the, the automated pen testing. Those are tools that are fully automated and they will do pen testing at a pretty decent level. Like they're not gonna catch all the, the really intuitive stuff. They're not gonna get the nitty gritty where you know somebody has to see something, test it, and go, well, that didn't react quite like I thought. Let me go play with that a little bit. Uh, you know, blind SQL injection being one of those uh, really interesting ones that you kind of have to play with a little bit to get it to work right. Um, but those are a really good way to continue your security journey while keeping your budget low. So definitely something to consider. You know, password analyses are usually really inexpensive. Um, doing the um, continuous password or continuous pen testing is, is pretty inexpensive, but you get a lot of value out of those. So when, whenever you're looking for a vendor, uh, whether it be us or any other of our competitors, you know, talk about managed services, you know, bring those up, say, hey, what can you do for us on a continuous basis? Because you'll get a lot of value out of things like that. All right, and would you consider the roadmap approach for your organization? Um, so most said yes, and about the other half actually was even between yes and maybe. So I, I call that a positive. Um, when we're when we're talking about this roadmap, you know, it, it, this is not a, a new concept, right? This is not something that uh, is, is unheard of. We're not we're not breaking ground. We're not reinventing the wheel. This is we're just organizing the information so that it's easier to to go through. If we are if we're looking at security and and we've seen this over and over and over again, where organizations are looking at things through a a, a microscope. When you're looking at, the, at at it through a microscope and you're trying to say, oh, we need to keep need to tweak in this one thing. We just need to tweak this one thing they're missing everything else. Like they, they can't see their peripheral vision. They can't see what's going on over on, on the right side. They, they don't know what, what's, what else is happening around them. Uh, we see that so often it's, it's actually kind of scary. So when you are looking at your security, how much are you really seeing? And how much of that are, are you really understanding? You know, is this something that you see as a whole? And maybe even as a CISO, maybe you're not seeing everything that you could be seeing. So if you are looking at something and then expecting somebody else to do the next thing, maybe that's that's their job, that's their responsibility. And you're not coming back to figure it out. You're counting on everybody else for you know awareness, right? Security awareness. Why aren't you more aware of your organization? Um, or what needs to be done or any of that stuff. So just really, really good things to think about, good things to, to plan for. Are you looking through you know, the microscope or are you seeing the whole picture? If you're seeing the whole picture, 
how much of that are you really seeing? Uh, we all have blinders on in some way. Me being, you know, so you know, adamant about password security because it's such a big part of every pen test I've ever done. I, I, I harp on it a lot, obviously, right? But somebody else might go, well, you know, maybe the applications are more important. So somebody else is going to check out those applications. And the, kind of the point of this is the roadmap is just a way for you to organize that information. So you say, okay, well, now I see the whole picture. I've, I've identified the assets. I've figured out the gaps. I've started, you know, scanning. I've done the managed services so I can start patching all those, those gaps up. I did the pen testing to validate everything. And then we did a red team to bring the whole thing together and, and really be able to fine tune the rest of it. And we're going to start over. And that is really all this is for. And I think that's it on the questions. Okay. Well, thanks, Morgan. And thank you, Jordan. Um, now we're going to move into the collaborative session. And um, we encourage you guys to uh, share or go on camera and unmute yourself if you've got a question or you want to respond to some of the topics that we thought would be interesting to discuss as a group. Um, this is also a great time to share stories, best practices. Um, so we'll, we'll start with the first. Um, so I'll turn it back over to Morgan um, to go through the first question. And if there's any Q&A questions that come up, we'll address those as they come in. Okay, Morgan, back to you. Excellent. Um, so have you worked with a red team? If so, what did you learn? Uh, has anybody here worked with a red team who has anything to share with that? And again, you can unmute yourself and we encourage you to go on camera just so we know that you um, would like to share something so that we can call on you. Or you can provide your information into the Q&A and I will come on and share that. Okay, nobody worked with a red team? All right, so how, how does, um, how often would your organization do pen tests? Uh, I, we've seen a lot of organizations do it, uh, you know, once or twice a year, depending on the kind of test. We've seen several do, you know, four times a year for like web applications or externals. Uh, so how often does your organization conduct uh, penetration testing? Don't be shy. We, have, we might have some share, some shy people out there. Um, so again, we just want to encourage you. This is a session for uh, all of you to share with each other. And, and also while we're doing that is, do you like the collaborative session? Because we've had a lot of people that have stayed on in previous sessions. And so share with us if, you know, in the chat or the Q and A, um, if you like these collaborative sessions as Morgan goes through and asks a couple of other topic questions. Okay. So topic three, maybe maybe we could put in chat any topics that are interesting that people might want to talk about. Otherwise, I'm just reading questions. Fine, I'll do number four. So uh, how much do you actually know about your um, your attack surface? This is, this is something we, we've asked several clients um, who they have an external presence, they have you know websites on the internet, they have a lot of things going on, but they don't really know what their attack surface is. Uh, and one of the really fun things we can do is we do uh, what we call OSINT or Open Source Intelligence Gathering. This is where we go out. We'll look for you know credentials in the dark web. We'll look for you know maybe maybe somebody tw uh, tweeted something and it just so happened to have just enough information for us to to glean some some real something really fun. Um, or uh, I, I did a gig once where it was it was a data center and there were people doing like selfies on Instagram and it was really weird, but I was able to actually get a layout of the, the whole data center through Instagram and Twitter and other like social media because people were 
weirdly taking selfies in there. So things like that are, are really fascinating. So we can consider that part of your tax surface. It's what we can find online to glean as much information as possible about your organization, what network stacks you have. Are you putting out uh, uh, job opportunities that are telling some, some person that they need specific Cisco information or Cisco experience? Um, so there, there's a lot of really cool stuff out there. Uh, if you don't understand your attack surface, you know, feel free to ask about it. Um, and we, those are kind of things we like to do a lot. So um, Natalie wrote. Yep. Sorry? Did, you, did you see that? Did you see that, Morgan, from Nat, from Natalie? I did. Uh, okay. I'd like to talk about training more. I appreciate the ideas you shared. What else can we do in addition to the web-based training? Uh, we really like our no before training, which we've seen that a lot. Uh, it's a really good platform, uh, and the phishing, USB assessments, etc. We have through that provider. So no before is actually a really good company. Um, <clears throat> there's another one. I'm, I'm blanking on the name right now. It's it's a, a female run, and she's incredible. She's a social engineer, and she is probably one of the best I've ever known. Uh, but she goes around the country. And she, that's all she and her company do is uh, you know awareness training. So she does, and she'll go physically and, and talk. And that's what I like to do. Is I like to. Do well, no, so um, I'll, I'll give one example where it was really, really fun assessment. So it was an internal pen test with a little bit of physical thrown in, uh, and this was a food manufacturer uh, where I was able to get in to the food production area from the street with no issues whatsoever. Didn't plan it; just said, "What's going to happen if I just walk in?" Uh, nobody stopped me. Nobody did anything. It was uh, it was kind of scary, uh, and I was walking around, no no headgear on, nothing like that. Nobody stopped me. Nobody said anything. Uh, of course, I stayed away from the food bit itself because I didn't want to actually contaminate anything. But it was it was really weird that they would allow that, and turned out they it was it was a Japanese company, and they were just really timid. It was part of their culture to be really timid. So they didn't want to bother anyone. They didn't want to be rude for any reason. Uh, I cracked 97 or 98% or so of their passwords. It was just like a really high number. It was almost 100% of their passwords um, through the internal portion of the pen test because I was able to get domain admin in less than four minutes. Uh, I was able to compromise just about everything they had because they didn't really do updates. Like it was the whole company was just a disaster. And I did a <clears throat> awareness training for them. And I, I showed all the tools that we did. I, I have, you know, my drone. I've got some stuff that I made that's custom. I've got my badge reading kit. I've got my uh, lock picks, my fake IDs, all that stuff. And I put that out in front of them. And I said, these are the tools that you should be looking out for. These are the things that if you see, you probably let somebody know. And they really responded to it. I was sharing, uh, you know, some information about their passwords. Like, hey, uh, you guys pretty much had the company name in most of your passwords. Uh, it was like something like eighty percent of their passwords contained the company name. Um, so things like that are really fascinating. And, and you show them those passwords, they go, "Oh, that was me. That's my password." And it, it really kind of resonates, hits home, and now they now they see like, "Oh, I actually was compromised. I actually was uh, attacked." Now I can start taking this more seriously. So things like that are really fascinating uh, when you get into the, the psychological piece of the social engineering and and why they need to be more more uh, aware. Uh, did another one for uh, auto auto manufacturer where we were able to get into like where they were building the the concept cars. That was the coolest thing ever. Uh, but we were able to get in there no problems. And again, nobody stopped us. You see that a lot in healthcare too. I can go walk around and more often than not, I do not get stopped. I have pretty noticeable features, right? And why aren't people noting, uh, knowing that I'm not 
part of the staff. I do, obviously don't look like I belong. I'm not dressed like I belong. I'm not acting like I belong, but I'm just walking around and I could be plugging a USB drive into computers and I, I just almost never get stopped. Uh, so doing those, those kinds of things is really, uh, really interesting. With phishing, Ken asks, phishing best practices, we send regular test phishing emails to all staff at least once per month. Yeah, um, well, Ken was saying it basically uh, things need to get more personal, and, and I, I, I think that's a really good thing to, to keep in mind. People, especially if you're using you know, Know Before and others, they're great at what they do. They're, those are really good organizations. Um, they're, they're very good at, at the phishing. The training, I would say they, you have to go a little bit further, even if it's um, to make sure that your users understand that they were the ones who caused the breach. Uh, obviously, we don't ever want to make sure, you know, we, we never want to make people feel bad. We never want to make people um, feel targeted. Uh, but in some cases, you might need that little, that little extra oomph to, to make sure that they understand, like, this is, this is serious. We're not playing around. You know, these breaches cost millions of dollars. And if it's because somebody clicked a link, that's a very expensive click, you know? So how much is your, how much is your training really helping to prevent that, that click from happening? Good things to, good things to do. Morgan, um, Natalie asked a follow on question, which is would discussing the results of the phishing test uh, assessments, et cetera, during monthly meetings, improve the training effectiveness? I think that's a great idea. Um, we, we've seen that. I've only seen that really once or twice before where they brought it up at a regular, on a regular interval. Uh, but it seemed to be fairly effective because people were more conscientious about it. It was part of their everyday life now uh, because they were, they were constantly reminded instead of once a year, now they're getting it, you know, every week, every month, whatever the case might be. And it's not just click the link and go down this road. It's, Hey, um, Sally got a phishing email. Uh, over here at Synergistic, we have an actual chat room where we talk about every time somebody gets a phishing email, they'll post it in the chat room and say, hey, guys, check this one out. This is what's going on, uh, and we'll, we'll discuss it. Uh, in some cases, we'll laugh about it because, you know, they're very, you know, we're, we're still getting the Nigerian Prince emails, which are awesome, uh, and I, I, I enjoy seeing those. So discussing it regularly is, is a very good strategy to keep people engaged in, in what's going on and understanding that they cannot just be clicking links. So it's a constant training. Very good question, Natalie. All right. Um, so I, I wanted to ask, uh, if cost isn't an issue, if there is no barrier on your cost and you guys had tons of money just laying around, what would you want? What would you get as maybe the first uh, assessment and why? Kind of a top, top three wish list. Again, remember that you can go off of mute and turn on your camera. If you want to share live or you can answer in the chat. And, and while um, everybody's going to be thinking about that question is I just want to share to add on to Morgan how we have a Slack channel where we talk about fishing exercises is our CISO here. Um, he does report on a monthly basis. Um, we, we do a lot of fish, internal fishing exercises and things that are happening and he shares those um, in every in each of our leadership meetings. It's very eye-opening. Yeah, they're, they're a lot of fun. Um, my my team, at the very least, we we enjoy seeing that stuff as uh, it's it's kind of getting getting uh, schooled by the competition. We, we get to see what what attacks are happening, and, and we get to pass that savings on to our clients. Well, 
Okay, well, well, Morgan, I, I don't think we're um, getting any other responses. Um, so again, if you don't have any other further questions, I guess we can wrap up. Um, and I wanna say an extra thank you to, to both you, Morgan and Jordan for walking us through this session. Um, and as I say that, we get one more question. Um, is there a way to disable links and emails? That seems like the number one source of compromise. There is, um, and it's essentially it's turning off, and it's not foolproof, of course, but it's turning off the HTML view. Uh, so most emails you're getting, especially through Outlook, they're all HTML enabled. Uh, but a lot of organizations will disable that feature on the policy level, uh, you know, group policies and things like that to disable being able to view an HTML. Uh, that will disable the hyperlink. Okay, some of these were really great questions and I appreciate the participation. Um, so if you want to continue this conversation afterwards, um, please reach out to us. We'll get you in um, contact with Morgan or Jordan or one of our other red team members. Um, so until next time, I want to thank you again and join us for September 8th for our fifth session with Tallahassee Memorial as we go through a case study on protecting patient privacy with user access monitoring. And also remember that we will have this recording um, on demand at the end of the day, and you can always forward the, the registration link to your peers, and they can also access any future and past events. Okay, well, everybody have a great Wednesday and see you on September 8th. Thank you all for joining.